I'm Tim Ellis, and thank you for joining us for Laneway Live. Tonight's guest is not only one of the funniest magicians on the planet, he's also one of the busiest. He's hosting not one, not two, not three, but four regular internet shows. So we're so pleased he could squeeze in the time to visit with us. Please welcome Harrison Greenbaum. I went to Harvard and now I'm a magician. They cancel each other out. <laughs> it's like being straight and having this voice. I had to sit them down. I was like, Mom, Dad, this is very difficult, but I have something very important to tell you. And they were like, you're gay. I was like, <laughs> I was like, no, I want to be a magician. And they were like, we'd rather you be gay. Like, is that? You can't do that. No, you're not a boy wizard. I am. <laughs> you don't even know what this is. This is like an iPad with one app. I do magic, by the way, is because my girlfriend, my girlfriend, screw you guys. Um, <laughs> no, she's imaginary, but definitely a girl. And she, she wants me to be more like Jesus. I was like, I'm a slightly effeminate Jew who can do magic tricks. How much closer can I get? Damn it! Boom, boom, boom. The devil's favorite playing card. Yes! Okay, here we go. We got it. Watch out. Watch out. The devil's uh, other favorite playing card. Support me. Support me. Okay, support me. It's not like my parents. My license. <laughs> That's me when I was 16. Yeah, see, look, I still have hope. <laughs> Hello, how's it going everybody? Live from New York City. Yes, it is currently 11 p.m. in the past. <laughs> so you are in an apartment in New York City? Yes, I am currently in a, uh, a, a small 500 or 550 square foot apartment in New York City, which I looked up the math and Frank hid in 450 square feet, I think. So I have 100 square feet on her. But you're sharing it. I am sharing it with my girlfriend, who is very real and definitely in that behind that door and is not imaginary at all. Of course, of course. <laughs> so so you, you, you've been in, in quarantine for how long so far? We have been in quarantine go, uh, almost two weeks, getting close to two, the two week mark. And you're not, no signs of cabin fever yet? Um, you know, I, I have a roof deck for my apartment. So once in a while I get a little fresh air that way. Um, I had to pick up a medication, so I was able to walk outside and wear like a mask and gloves like it was uh, the apocalypse. That, that was a whole weird thing. Um, and uh, so I've been outside briefly to pick up med medicine. So that, 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 that was nice. I never kind of looked outside and was just like, ah, oh, this is nice. Is it empty? Empty. New York City is normally like bumper to bumper traffic and just people all over the place. And you could look straight down streets and see nothing. That's amazing. So yeah, it's very maybe, quiet. You think maybe the world's resetting itself at this point? <laughs> yeah, this is just uh, God hitting the reset button. Like, nope. <laughs> I like to think that he's been getting a lot of prayers for like vacations and like more time with family. And they've been solely stockpiling. You know, he's, you know, he's watching some Netflix show and he doesn't realize his inbox is filling up. And then he's just like, oh, shit. And then he just hits the one button that solves all of it. And then Jesus comes in like, what have you done? Yeah, yeah, I think that I think we'll say we'll say that's what's going on. So, so okay. for the people who uh, have not encountered you before, we we met you in the Unbelievables when you came to Melbourne. Yes, yes, in Melbourne. I say it right now. I do it. Do. I, I, all my Americans say Melbourne, and I go Melbourne, and they look at you like you're an idiot. You go, that's how we. No, say. they look at me like those douchebags that when they're in a Mexican restaurant go, "I'll take the a quesadilla." <laughs> So, so you came to Melbourne and did the Unbelievables. So what, what was the, uh, the story, the backstory with that, how you got rung into that? Yeah, uh, it was actually really, really fun. Um, I encountered uh, The Works. They're the company that does The Illusionist. Um, so they were in New York doing their first Broadway run. And uh, some of the cast members had seen me at Monday Night Magic where I was headlining. And they were like, you got to see this guy. So they brought the producers to Monday Night Magic. Um, and they were like, oh, we definitely want to see if we can work you in to the show, there's definitely room. 
Uh, so they sent me to Perth, Australia with the illusionists. I just got back from Australia. Anybody been to Australia? You been? It's a fun place. I recommend people go. I think it's a wonderful, diverse group of white people. And they're a crazy country. They're as far away as you can get. They're a little crazy, right? Like in the 60s, I didn't know this until I got there. One of the Australians told me. They had a prime minister named Harold Halt. And he went swimming in 1967. He never came back. They just voted for a new one. And then they named the National Swim Center after him. The guy who drowned. Swim Center. Could have been a statue, like, no, every pool. I have so many questions. That's mind blowing, right? Like, where was his security team? And can we hire them for our guy? Yeah. Um, and then right after that was done, they were like, cool, you're coming back in Christmas. You're going to be the host of The Unbelievables, which instead of it being seven magicians, it'll be seven variety acts. So it'll be like The Illusionist, but it won't be exclusively magic. You'll do magic. We had Shin Lim as well, who did uh, Magic Magic. Um, I did comedy and magic. And we had jugglers and acrobats and all that stuff. And it was an incredible tour. We did the Sydney Opera House for, I think it was 22 shows. Hamer Hall in Melbourne, which was so fun. I love Melbourne reminds me the most of New York, so I felt, I think, the most at home there. Uh, Sydney reminded me a little bit more of, like, Los Angeles. Um, and then we went to Perth, which was awesome, because I had never met a quokka before. And what does Perth remind you of? What city does Perth remind you of? Detroit. No, Detroit. I don't think so. <laughs> it reminds me, like, of a, like a Philadelphia or maybe, like, a Seattle, maybe a San Francisco. It's like, it's, it was a cool, it's actually really, really cool. Hmm. Uh, we stayed, the first time we stayed in Perth, we stayed at the casino. So we never really ventured out. We stayed basically three and a half weeks just in the casino. What, we took one trip once. Uh, then the second time we stayed in the city. So we really took advantage of, there's like a, a, the most incredible mini golf course I've ever been on is in Perth. Mm. Uh, the restaurants were, were amazing. It was, it was really cool. So you, you're not also a, uh, a mini golf aficionado, are you? I am not, although I do love me some mini golf. <laughs> <laughs> I if people thought... are on my Instagram, uh, not yeah. to plug it, but at Harrison Comedy, um, I was in Gulf Shores, Alabama a few weeks ago uh, when you could tour and perform for people. Do you remember that? Those were the days. Those were the days. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah, I was performing for real people in one room without any distance. And um, back then, if uh, only half the seats were filled, uh, you had nobody to blame but yourself. Uh, but we'd sold out two shows, and I was in Gulf Shores, Alabama, and I, was, I loved doing weird, kooky stuff. And there was a mini golf that was just open. And I was like, I might as well go. And it was right near the venue. And it was an honor system mini golf. So they had a little box and it said, please put $5 in or $5 and 50 cents, which was frustrating because I had $5 and a dollar. So I gave them six. I think they knew it. I think they knew how to get that extra 50 cents. But they're like, put the money in the box and take the club and don't destroy our course. I was and I played course? mini golf alone with no supervision. <laughs> In Gulf I've Shores, always, Alabama. I've always thought if I wasn't a professional magician, I'd be a professional mini golfer. Really? Yeah, but I'm not very good. What's your favorite course? Work. Uh, I, I remember years and years ago, many years ago, Tom Ogden took me to one. He, we, 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 I'd stayed at the castle and he took me back to the airport and we were early. So he took me to a mini golf course right next to Los Angeles airport. <laughs> and it was actually really good. <laughs> You know what, LA has so many people who do set design that like their escape rooms, but that, that's my big thing. I'm an escape room person. Oh. But the, the mini golf too, like you have all these set designers who are like, I don't know, I have nothing to do between movies. So let's just build the craziest golf course in the world. There was one I remember, I, 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 I'm sure I didn't dream it, but it was like, it was supposed to be a golf course set in space. So when you go in, the whole floors were, were perspex. So you could Whoa. see. And so it was it impossible cool. to play, but it was amazing. But I, 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 I still, I'm still not sure if I dreamt it. I, I, I think it was real. I think it was on the it golf course. It was a regular course. golf course, but they made you do mushrooms first. So you have, you know, you're like, it was mini golf and everything was clear. And they're like, it was very real. And all the old people were horrified. <laughs> now, uh, people also might recognize you from your comedy area because uh you're, you've been on uh, america's got talent as a comedian and last comic standing and conan and a lot of other shows that is right tim i have been eliminated from many reality television shows <laughs> that's correct Even with conan i'm sorry that's <laughs> <laughs> yeah exactly no that was that it was very interesting because i had just come off of america's got talent and uh conan was 
a very different experience because it was just, they were just like, oh, Mr. Greenbaum, let us shine your shoes. Let us, we want to make sure you have the best possible set. On America's Got Talent, if you don't have a good set, it's still good television for them. So they're, they're, the incentives are slightly different. Not mm -hmm. that it wasn't an incredible thing to be a part of. Like that clip probably was seen by more people than anything I've ever done. Um, but doing Conan, so I grew up, you know, watching Conan and uh, he's somebody that I've always loved. So being able to be on the show was, was insane. And have you got to uh, perform with a lot of your comedy idols? Yeah, it's been nuts. Uh, I wrote my thesis in college using a, a Chris Rock bit. And I was able to sit across the table from Chris Rock and be like, you know, I wrote my thesis based on one of your bits. And he was like, he seemed very creeped out about it. He was like, why? Why would you do that? That's yeah, true. it was a fun thesis. It was on um, the effect of racial humor on prejudice. So does listening to jokes about race actually change, make you, you know, make you more or less racist? Can it affect your bias? Um, and the, the preliminary study that I did essentially, I mean, it, does, it wasn't, it didn't have the, the numbers of, of participants that you'd really need to demonstrably prove something, you know, on, on, you know beyond a reasonable doubt. Um, but the, the, the numbers seem to suggest that, yeah, um, the, with the humor that I was studying, at least, the people who listened to those jokes, it changed their mind in, in one direction or the other. It definitely changed, it, it made the people who were leading a little bit racist more racist, and the people who were leading a little bit not racist le even less racist. Because the jokes that I were looking at um, was something I'd called self-affirming humor in which the joke teller and the target of the humor are the same. Um, and the audience is the opposite. So in that case, it was Chris Rock doing his bit, uh, Black people versus N-words is the bit. I won't say the actual word, but um, he, he yeah. uses the word. But that's a very famous bit that he stopped doing because he was worried about its effect on, uh, on racist white people. Um, and so we, we played that clip for white people um, to see what it would do to their sort of their, we call it implicit attitude. Uh, we, the, we use an IAT. This is all a lot of scientific jumble to say. We made people listen to one of Chris Rock's funniest bits and we, seed if it, we saw if it made seed, Jesus. Um, we saw if it made them uh, more or less racist. And, it, and the data showed that it, it quite possibly did. That was so it, it was, uh, it, it, the, what Chris Rock saw anecdotally was borne out in the data. So it was kind of a, a neat experiment to do. That was bias confirmation, basically. Yeah, the people who were racist saw it as proof that they were right, and the people who weren't racist saw it as proof that they were right. Amazing. Yeah. Now, you, do, you meet, do you meet a lot of other famous comedians in the Friars Club? You know, the Friars Club right now is closed, and not because of Corona. <laughs> they, had, they had a pipe burst very mysteriously uh, several months ago, I think it was, and they just closed. So they're still closed. Um, so I don't know. But when I I always love the roasts, and I've I've I, I've done a lot of roasts and roast battles in my career. And so when the opportunity came to join the Friars Club, I, I jumped on it at, at the time, and it was very cool. While I was there, I got to wear the robe and do the schwitz. And my last comic standing, I got to hang out with Gilbert Gottfried in the Friars Club, wearing our things. And and a funny story about that, um, if I might, um, was just that Gilbert. So we called Gilbert in to be, they asked me, is there anybody you know that would do a segment with you for Last Comic, like at the Friars? And uh, I was like, oh, I think Gilbert would be down. I've done, I just done a charity benefit with him. And I was like, he's, he's gonna be amazing. So we texted, we got him to come down. Um, he was super amazing about it. And the segment is, he's supposed to be laying in a chair in a Barker lounger in his robe. And I'm supposed to walk in like I just came out of the sauna and say, hey, Gilbert, and point to the empty chair and go, oh, do you mind if I sit down? And he's supposed to go, oh yeah. And then that kicks off uh, him giving me advice. So we have the whole shot set up, we're ready. I walk out, I go, Gilbert, do you mind if I take this seat? And he goes, I'm saving it for Buddy Hackett, who was dead, by the way, at the time. <laughs> and so I just looked at him like, so I guess he's not using it. But it was literally as soon as the cameras roll, I was like, okay, that is, that is the funniest thing to do, is to not let me sit down in my own shot. That was very fun. Now, the, uh, the, the craziness is continuing because you had a, uh, a very busy schedule that has been uh, rudely interrupted by this uh, yeah. little thing, this little, just the flu, whatever it is going around. The Rona. I'm calling it the Rona now. That's what we call it. We call it, we call it Roni. You got the Roni? <laughs> you know I'm going to eat some like. brekkie and then go fight my Roni. Yeah. I saw, I saw him the other day. He was uh, going down the barbie and... Uh, he was sitting there having a couple of tinnies with mates and suddenly uh, he said, he's got the Roni. We chucked him out of there. 
Yeah, I love that. When I say I've been to Australia a bunch, people are always like, oh, shrimp on the bobby. And I'm like, they're prawns. <laughs> yes. They don't exist. What are you talking about? That's not a thing. Uh, but yeah, no, I was doing uh, 600 plus shows a year. Obviously this year, the number's going to be smaller. Um, but in order to fill the time, I have done, I, I have a full calendar now of live streaming shows. No, um, so if those count as shows, then uh, I guess I'm still keeping the numbers. So you've got Corona cast? Corona cast is just me casting to my own personal Facebook and Instagram. Mm. Uh, we got Scam, the Society of Conjurers and Magicians, a very real and very secret organization you should not have heard of. Uh, please don't visit this website.com. Don't do it. And uh, we're, I'm looking at my, by the way, I'm looking up at my calendar, which is above my wall. I'm not oh, yeah. looking into space. Um, and then on Mondays and Wednesdays, I'm doing Who Books That with Harrison Greenbaum. That's me. Uh, and I'm interviewing um, all the people I've always wanted to interview, but now are not too busy for me. That's the one. And that's been thing. amazing. Yeah, that's why I can chat with people like yourself when I normally, you're too busy off going doing shows. Well, the one good thing is you're in Australia time, so it, I, I don't mind doing a podcast interview at midnight. That's fine. <laughs> You'd be the one that snuck in. Yeah, I can sneak in. I, we're, get, we're getting to chat to all sorts of people, which is fantastic. But uh, I, I will put all the links down there for people who want to visit yeah. you. Oh, and the other one, there's one more, which is because oh, I'm an insane person. Yeah. Uh, but on Tuesdays and Fridays, I'm the host of the National Lampoon Quarantine Live. So that's going to be our attempt at a comedy show, which is going to be interesting because magic, at least, I think there's a visual component yeah. and you can be interactive through the webcam, which is, I think, really cool. If you're like, hey, somebody in another country or state, name a number and then it's on the thing that you're holding and that hasn't cut away from. That's cool. Um, but we're, we're trying to make comedy work because, uh, man, we don't want to come out of this rusty. That would be the worst is all of a sudden every comic on stage has not been on stage for two months. It'll be, it'll be quite the scene. Well, so uh, with National Lampoon, who's going to be on that? You've got well-known guests? Yeah, super famous comics. Um, we released the lineup for the first episode. That comes out. Um, and we have Krista Stefano, who's amazing. Uh, Suba Agrawal, um, Katie Hannigan, just some really great comics. Most of them are New York-based, although Suba is in LA. Um, and we're going to be bringing out, the, the guest lists are going to get uh, pretty insane. So I'm, I'm excited. And they can be worldwide too. No limits. I know, that's what's so crazy is, like my interview thing with, uh, you know, I had Matt King who's in Vegas and then we had a surprise guest, which was Lance Burton, who's in Kentucky. And I was able to interview all of them simultaneously. I saw Matt's eyes light up in delight. <laughs> well, I legitimately did not tell Matt. It was a complete surprise. I texted Lance and I said, hey, I'm doing this interview thing for the International Brotherhood of Magicians. And it would be really funny if we just surprise you. If I say, hey, I have a question from the audience because Matt doesn't know who the question's coming from and you pop up and then you can ask him whatever you want. And Lance was amazing. Lance was so fun. We were texting during the thing because I was like, you should come back at the end. He's like, ah, yeah, absolutely. Now you were talking about the difference between comedy and magic on the web. Uh, apart from the fact, the, the similarity is the fact that you don't need a budget to put them together, which is fantastic. <laughs> uh, the, the negative of course, is that nobody gets paid, which is, well, there's not much of a change there for a lot of a lot of us. Uh, but no, honestly, honestly, uh, you know, the the in LA at least, um, you get paid car fare when you do the club, so that's eight dollars a set. So if somebody makes a donation of like ten dollars, we're already ahead of the game. <laughs> but the, you were saying that uh, the challenge with magic is that you know you you can be interactive, but with comedy because you don't have that uh, immediate feedback. You was you were saying earlier it's a bit like comedy on radio. Yeah, I mean, I've done radio and you at least have your co-hosts. So you have like one or two people in the studio with you and they're kind of overlapping, or at least they're trying to laugh and they're being, they're being good hosts. So at least you feel like your, laugh, your joke is hitting, but you, you have to imagine in your head that all these people driving are also laughing with you, um, which is still a little bit surreal. Uh, so we're, we're trying to replicate that as much as we can with the National Lampoon Show and that we're gonna have audience on the side. And, but yeah, I mean, um, somebody else, uh, another comedian has said that, and I think it's been said a bunch before, but uh, you know, stand-up comedy without laughter is just slam poetry. That's... So it, the, the reason comedy is comedy is because people are laughing to it and you remove that and it's, it's hard. Because also I, I use the laughter to, to hone in on what an audience finds funny. You know, I'm, they're guiding me towards my funniest material for them. And without that, you're a little bit rudderless. And magic without an audience is like a dealer's dim. Yeah, although you know what? It's like, 
I always say, if you hire me for an event and I'm a guitar player and nobody's paying attention to me, I can be playing in the background and anybody's paying attention is like, that is the greatest guitar player I've ever heard. Mm. If there's a comedian in that situation and nobody's paying attention, nobody's giving that guy a positive review. No one's even like, that guy who talked to himself was hilarious. I mean, like, there was a really mentally ill man who would not shut up and he used a microphone. I've, we've actually had, uh, I've seen it in, in the streets of Melbourne, every now and again, as we go through the buskers, there's somebody standing there doing stand-up comedy to nobody. It's amazing. You know what? There, there's a guy named Charlie Barnett who was famous in, I think it was the 80s, if not the 90s, for doing stand-up comedy in Washington Square Park. He was friends with like Dave Chappelle and Jeff Ross and a bunch of the big guys. And he was notorious. He could build a crowd. He actually figured out how to make stand-up work outside. And I think one of the reasons that people loved him so much is because that is super rare. I don't think I've ever seen anybody else. But he would, there's videos of him online. It's, it's really, it's, it's amazing. I'm going to have to put a link down there so people can ha have a look and find the videos. That's a good tip. Yeah, and if you think it's hard enough getting a laugh as a stand-up every 20 seconds, he had to keep your, he could not lose. He could not not get a laugh because people would walk away. So he, it made him this very aggressive, very like boom, 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 boom. He, he was remarkable stuff. It's really interesting. It was a lot better than the guy I saw. He had actually had a script of, of jokes he'd written out and was basically reading them into a microphone as people were walking by. Oh God, that's just an open mic. <laughs> oh Lord. It's open mic night on the street, anyone? <laughs> <laughs> I guess technically it's open mic. <laughs> yes. You sure he was a stand up where he wasn't just being like, so I'm going to kill myself. Is anybody going to stop me? Is anybody, is this thing on? Okay, I'm going to do it. At one point he did say, so these are some new jokes that I've just written. Um. <laughs> That's by the way, not, not, not every time is it a lie, but a lot of comedians, if they're nervous about a show, if you go, Oh, are you, are you excited? You go, uh, I'm doing a, uh, some new stuff. And that's a way, because if, you do, if you say that and you do poorly, well, it's because it was new stuff. And if you do well, you go, wow, he's amazing. He's killing with new stuff. So it's like a win-win for them. So I, I know many a comic who will say, this is new stuff, just as a, as a cover sometimes. Yeah, like no magicians have ever said that. <laughs> <laughs> That's fair. Well, no, they say this is new stuff. And not only is it not new, it's not theirs. Well, that's yes, that's true. Now, I, I noticed the good thing with uh, your scam show was you did have because uh, I think all your shows are quite unique. All the different shows you've got, got the scam show had audience members popping in. So if you have Zoom, I assume you're using Zoom on the scam show. Oh no, we're using uh, a different a different app because we the first time we tried scam, we did it with Zoom, and I put out the link, and over fifty people immediately joined Zoom, and it essentially crashed the stream. We couldn't stream it to Facebook because my computer was like, how much video can I process simultaneously? <laughs> and also, if you mute people, they have the power in Zoom generally to unmute. So we would mute people who were just like, hey, I'm watching the magic show. Do you wanna, do you wanna come see the magic show? No, no, come here, come here. And we can't mute them, because we'd mute them, and then they would go, oh, I think I accidentally hit the mute. And then they'd unmute it, and so that audio is going over the magicians. So we were like, we need to come up with another solution. So. I, I got very lucky because I, uh, uh, I don't know if you know Steven and Nikki out in Vegas, but they, they stage managed for a ton of stuff for Cirque, for Magic Live. And they were like, we will absolutely love, love to help with Scam. And they, they uh, Steve show ran for us today and it made it a much smoother affair. It looked great. I mean, you had, had the audience sitting up on one side and magicians popping in and out. It looked really good. I was very impressed. And, and so oh, your, you. your other ones, um, your Corona cast is just Facebook. Just, you're talking to the audience and they can yeah. pop in with their feedback. And then uh, your other show is different again. Your yeah, uh, Who Books That is, uh, uh, w is with the IBM. Um, that also has a similar production value to Scam. And National Lampoon will also. National Lampoon, we're going to try to keep the audience in the feed as much as possible because uh, we, want, we want the comedians to have laughter. We want them to feel comfortable to tell a joke. And I'll laugh at it. Um, you know, I'll be, I'll be feedback for them. But I want them to be able to hear real laughter. And I want people who are just watching it who are not in the audience to see laughter because it we're so trained we're so trained with laugh tracks and sitcoms and you know these these ja I was a warm up comic um, for TV so I know what goes into making those audiences you know react as loudly as they do so we that's what we expect so when we don't hear it even if you know our our rational brain knows that that's why the laughters aren't isn't there is because there's physically nobody there that the the lizard part is just like maybe it's not so funny 
Well, that's, that's the funny thing because often in the audience, uh, especially when people are amazed, because uh, I have my own little theater here with 32 seats. And so I'm doing close up magic and sometimes I'll project on the screen behind me. And sometimes the audience reacts like, and I have to sort of let them know, please like make a noise because <laughs> they're all sort of going, oh. and then thinking nobody, nobody clapped. Maybe I was the only one who was impressed. <laughs> So they, as soon as you get at least one or two people like, whoa, that was amazing. Then they're like, oh yeah, well, yeah, it was great. And the whole show just lifts. Yeah, no, a hundred percent. But it's great that you're really trying all these new things out. And I think there's a lot of people experimenting with new technology and trying to get themselves into the audiences and, and spread the word. Uh, but the big question is, how can we monetize it? How can we actually earn an income? Because this could go... They're saying, you know, six to eight months of, of us just sitting at home going, we're, we're running out of money. <laughs> oh, no, if this lasts for six months, the, the last live stream is just me hanging from the roof <laughs> and just the thing, the thing going for 24 hours until the police cut me down. Um, I, don't, I don't think it's going to be six months. I, I pray that it's not. I don't know who I'm praying to, um, but let's just use that. Um, I don't think it's going to be six months. Um, but yeah, you know what? It's been interesting because with uh, who books that is sponsored and presented by IBM. Um, we're not really doing it for money anyway. It's, 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 it's really to uh, bring these incredible talents to magicians to watch and learn from. And people mm -hmm. uh, were super thrilled to be able to have Mac and Lance tell stories. And I, I was super thrilled to be able to sort of help usher, usher that. And, um, and next week we have Kaylin and Ginger, who I'm like pumped to talk to. Because um, we toured Kazakhstan together, you which is going to be stories. wild. Yes. Uh, and we have Shin Lim on Wednesday. And that's, I think, just going to be awesome. Because I toured The Unbelievables with yes. Shin Lim. So we have a lot of crazy stories to, uh, to, to talk about. And then his career has continued to explode. So yeah. uh, he, we'll have plenty to talk about. But with Scam and with uh, the National Lampoon, we're just asking people for donations um, or contributions, whatever we want to call them. Just, mm -hmm. If you enjoyed this and you have spare cash, even if it's a dollar, toss it at the Venmo and we're going to split it amongst the performers. And so far, you know, both scam, we've had two episodes of scam. People have been really generous and really nice. And I hate asking for money. Um, I'm the worst at it, even though I am a Jew, um, but I'm the worst at it. And uh, you know, in this economy, you have no choice uh, in, in this sort of situation. Um, and uh, I also want to make sure that other people on my, on my live streams get paid. So um, yeah. people have been very generous. So thus far, it's not enough to pay my rent or to pay the rent of anybody performing, but it's not nothing. Mm -hmm. Yeah, we have a tip jar at the bottom of the tip jar, but it's like, it's like we've all become street entertainers who are invited to people's homes. Yeah, online street busking. I, I, Charlie Barnett, if he was alive, this would, be his, this would be it for him. He'd be killing it. He'd be very happy. Well, it has been great to catch up with you. Is there anything else you want to tell everybody before we, uh, before we say goodbye? Um, Final plan. Wow, uh, this went this by went, went so quickly. You're a fantastic host, Tim. Um, I mean, I guess if people want to support me, go to harrisongreenbaum.com in terms of following all my social media at Harrison Comedy. Um, and yeah, I my schedule will be up on my my tour schedule is now a live streaming schedule. Um, but yeah, Mondays through Friday, I'm streaming. Um, I'm doing stuff also on Saturdays and Sundays. I'm popping in on other people's shows and doing uh, lectures and stuff. Um, it's a reason to get dressed in the morning. I do. You know what? I find it very important um, to wear pants uh, during most of the live streams. You get to guess which ones I'm pantless. Um, <laughs> this one? Uh, Who knows? Who knows? Um, what if I made that a game? It's like, I'm going to stand up and then <laughs> you have to guess pants or no pants. But yeah, just follow me on social media at Harrison Comedy. Um, check out all the live streams that are happening and, uh, and so be, be nice to everybody. I think that's, you know, as long as that, that's got to be the thing, you know, staying home is being nice to everybody and tipping people that are delivering stuff to you extra is being nice to everybody. And yeah, and hopefully making this kind of content um, is, is being nice to everybody too. I think this, this what you're doing is, is hopefully giving people a, a fun distraction. Hopefully. And it's also, I think, important that the, the people can see that magicians all around the world, we're all in it together. We're sitting here hoping that this will be over soon so we can get back to work, but we're all we're all sort of doing the same sort of thing. So a lot, of, I know a lot of people are very depressed and very sad about it, but when you get to chat with other people and see other people in all over, all around the world, 
they're going through the same thing. It, it does give you hope that it, w- it will be over soon. Yeah, and it, I, are you growing your beard out? Is that, are you, are you very clean shaven? Are you gonna do a quarantine beard? I'm not gonna do a quarantine beard. You don't want to I'm see doing a quarantine me. beard, baby. You don't want to see me with a quarantine beard. <laughs> oh, I do though. I want every magician to stop shaving right now. If you're watching, stop shaving, and then we're all wizards by the end of this. That's my goal. All right, well, comments down below. <laughs> If there's enough, there'll be a beard, but I don't think there will be. I think I'm safe. (laughs) Thanks Thanks so much, Tim. Bye.